Welcome into another episode of Bourbon and a Buddy, this time with former Chicago Bear legend Kyle Long, presented by Wyoming Whiskey. My name is Shane Reardon. Kyle, are you familiar with Wyoming Whiskey? Shane, it's my first time hearing about it, but I always trust your expertise, you know, whether it comes to uh, media or cooking, but now whiskey. Oh, wow. I know you're a bourbon guy, so yeah. this will be good. Wyoming whiskey. So, I like Wyoming. Wyoming whiskey, as you can assume, is distilled. Where do you think? <laughs> one, one could only assume. Yep, it's Wyoming. So they have my favorite thing about them, though, is that they take their spent grain from distilling the whiskey and they feed it to cows. Uh, and then they sell the cow meat to restaurants, and the restaurant can sell steak that was eating whiskey grain. That is delicious. That. I bet that is a, a fine, smoky tasting meat. You'd have to dry age that cut. Yeah. I bet I'm not. I'm not too well versed in the cooking, but my wife is amazing, and I'm learning. Like uh, I've been doing cast iron recently and trying sure. to cook cook things with different oils, different smoke points. I'm learning is a Huge really? fucking thing. You're yeah, getting yeah. that deep into it? Yeah, I'm learning all this stuff. Like I'm using high heat oils. Like a uh, flax seed or grape seed or yes. Like I I I grape seed is one that I've used. Okay. I haven't used flax seed, I don't think. Uh, okay. but yeah, all kind of seeds. We fried some rice last night. I did my first rice fry. That was awesome. But back to beef, like there's gotta be the best taste coming off of a Wyoming Wyoming whiskey grain fed cow yeah. steak yeah it's awesome it's it's a very very unique flavor and we I'm better get that. some we uh, better get I'm some i'm drinking their standard wyoming whiskey they, they are a, a the parent company is the same company that puts out mccallan so it's it's a oh, very yeah. high quality it's very high quality shit right so i have that what do you have uh, I've got a, a Buffalo Trace here, uh, okay. Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. It was a bottle that I had upstairs, and I'm an old man, so I don't want to make my way back downstairs. I've got sure. a whole plethora of things downstairs. I'm sure there could be a cooler answer, but this is what I've nope. got, and it works every time. It's my it's my favorite. If if I see it, it's so Buffalo Trace. I don't know if you watch uh, Yellowstone, but since Buffalo Trace put all this money into advertising on the first episode of Yellowstone this season, their product has gone, like it's, it's gone everywhere. So if in Chicago, at least, if you find a bottle of Buffalo Trace in the stores, you buy it immediately because you probably won't see it again for months. It's a pain. It's my favorite, though. So that reminds me of a, a dear friend of mine who is an Illinois grad, uh, a wrestler slash football player. I met him with the Chiefs. Nick Allegretti is his name, and he's a Chicagoan. And he would always tell me to go like, you got to go down to this liquor store because they got this liquor in there right now, and it's delicious. You can't find it anywhere. Uh, the little tip you just gave me is a lot like uh, what Nick Allegretti would give. So, um, fun fact. Super Super Bowl champ, by the way, Last uh, the last couple of weeks. He's, a couple he's, times. He's yeah, got a couple, couple times. Now. Yeah, and yeah. He's, a, he's a free agent. So, uh, I know he didn't start on that line, but he would likely start on this Bears line if he wants to come home. But fun fact, Nick Allegretti's father, Carl, is a P1 major listener to the station, used to listen to Les Grobstein overnight, basically every night, bought the station some very nice 30th anniversary polos for our 30th anniversary broadcast back this summer. Carl, so, great guy. Carl's awesome, and Nick is just the best. I love playing with Nick, and our Chicago, uh, our, our crossover there really led to a lot of great conversations, and we were friends from the beginning. But he's a dad of twins now. Um but, yeah, if he has an opportunity to come home, bring the kid home, he is absolutely the type of guy that you need um, to, to lead in a room. He's been somewhere that, that's won. He's been around some young all pros and pro bowlers, Trey Smith, Creed Humphrey. They learn from guys like Nick Allegretti. Um, I'd be excited to see him in that, in that scheme. I know he's a tremendous run blocker, and, uh, and Justin would be lucky to have him out there in the past as well. So you were in the news a little bit, man. You well, made you made the Twitter viral video s uh, sphere there for a little while when you talked a bunch of shit about an interaction with Matt Nagy and then having to sit with him and his wife on a plane which, after a game after yep. he told you, basically, I don't want to ever see you again. Do you well, want to clear, clear up that interaction? Yeah, so I do, you know, and and Nags and I have spoken uh, not since my last 
story came out. But Nags and I have spoken throughout the years since Recently my departure. Recently promoted to offensive coordinator, and and yeah. he's gonna he's gonna be. I mean, he's gonna be great. The guys love him over there. I keep up with the offensive line from the Chiefs, and they they like Nagy a lot. And Mahomes knew him prior to him arriving, so he had those guys sold on Nags prior to. And now with EB heading to the Commanders, we're gonna see an extended role for Nagy in that offense under coach reed and i know they like one another but uh yeah man yeah so but but i mean let's let's break it down just a little bit because what do you what do you want to know in particular you talked about the situation in i I can't remember if you said it was halftime or after the game yeah we were we were in london we were in london and we were we were playing the raiders and i was playing like shit i mean for the last five years really I, i got on ir four or five years in a row and really stuff that can't really avoid uh, getting landed on here or rolled. You know what I'm saying? Things happen in football. Yeah. Sometimes uh, when it rains, it pours. And it did for me on the injury front. And I didn't get lucky there. But I was lucky enough to play some good ball early. And fans enjoyed my presence there. And I was lucky to do that. But at the end, I was injured. I was just kind of in the way. Uh, and I was in my own head. I was kind of a dickhead probably to a lot of the coaches, uh, seeing that I I probably put a lot of high expectations on myself that I couldn't meet at that point in my career physically. And I think Nagy was actually really cool about that. And he understood where I was in my career because he was a former athlete. So that's one side of things that people don't see about Nags. You know what I'm saying? Like he is cool. He does have that side of him. We just, you know, when, when, when pirates go out to sea and they see some shit and maybe there's some sea monsters out there and, they lost some good men and they come back and they're just different. Like Nagy and I, we're probably not going to be going to the country club, hanging out much together. We've been through too much shit together, but I respect him. I respect his game. I think he's going to be good for the chiefs, but as it pertains to the story, yeah, we were in the locker room. Um, He was chewing us out rightfully. So, and people made, when I said what I said, people made it out. Like I didn't know how to take an ass whooping and an ass chewing, man. Let me just tell you, I'm cool with that. I've had a ton of coaches. I had a lot of coaches in Chicago. You you know what I'm saying? So clearly a guy who stuck around through all that and was kept on the roster and knew how to deal with some of the issues um, that I, that I didn't handle at the end. So like my first five, six years, I probably handled it the right way. Year seven, eight, I was just fed up and they had to get me out of there. Nags was chewing us out at halftime. I was getting my shit stomped out. I got crushed the whole year that last year. And uh, I had just had it. I was embarrassed. You know, I was in London. My whole family was there. My wife, my my now wife and the mother of my my beautiful daughter, who's almost 11 months, Frankie Jane. She's not listening. Hopefully she's sleeping. Um, No, she listens, man. We we text all the time about this podcast. But yeah, getting on the plane. The real the the real hook is the getting on the plane because that's a long flight. I'd never been to Europe. You know what I mean? But that's a big your first time in Europe. That's a big and pond. on the way back, you're sitting next to across the. I'm aisle, literally, it's like it's like flight. a sleeper seat, and yeah. then there's an aisle at the end of my feet, going left to right, right to left, and across from me, sitting in the same seat, is like Matt and Mrs. Nagy. It was just uh, the juxtaposition of me trying to leave and then being stuck on a plane for what is it? An eight hour flight? Yeah, probably eight. Yeah, that's not probably too bad, eight. babe. That's not too bad. And you have eight, hour, eight hours, not too bad. My wife's playing Fortnite over there. Shout out to Kate. She's, She's a boss. She's playing Fortnite? She gets dubs. That's fun. She gets dubs. That's fun. So you said you've been chewed out, right? By You've had plenty of coaches. Yeah, I've been was, chewed out. Was, was Mark Tressman a guy to chew people out? Or no, was no, 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 no. Mark Who Tressman was staff not. was chewing people out? The, the pre-Matt Nagy staff. Um, well, I think that his henchman was obviously Aaron Cromer on the offensive side of the ball. Okay the offensive line coach, run game coordinator, really. He cried, uh, I heard. Aaron Cromer was a crier. An emotional guy. Some of the baddest men are the hardest criers. Yeah. You know, Shane, I've heard those. I've heard the trickling of the tears running out of, running off of your bed. Yeah, I cried. From down the hallway some nights. (laughs) Me too, and that's okay. Uh, So, yeah, Cromer would get in my ass. So, I, I went to Oregon, you know green the ducks there's green in there when i got to training camp he he called me he said i he where the fuck did you learn that 
green wave university he, he would never say oregon he'd never yeah. say the ducks he just just he just was shit on everything pat or charles tillman pat tillman rest in peace pat tillman charles yeah. tillman was one of our vets on on defense and during training camp my rookie year i remember i, I had a couple false starts i had never really dealt with cadence multiple cadences and it was big in our offense and mark tressman it was a point of emphasis we want to see what the defense is doing we're going to move players uh i was used to going fast 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 with mariota and chip kelly uh i go false start a couple times charles tillman is screaming in front of the bleachers with all the fans down there he's screaming give them their money back um so like whether I'm getting chewed out or I'm getting told to give my my harder money back, you know what I'm saying? Guys in my position, football players, um, understand that that just comes with the territory. You're going to hear a lot of things. You're going to read a lot of things on Twitter. Your wife could be at the grocery store and she could hear something from a fan. And, like, you know, shout out to the wives and the family. I don't even think about it, but, like, I didn't play with kids. Had, had I had children while I was playing, they would have had to listen to it as well. And then I think of it, we go back to Nagy. I think about his sons. And I remember meeting his sons at training camp and they were awesome. Young boys, impressionable yeah. kids. I'm sure they heard a lot of stuff. Well, they, um, they, that did. they didn't, there was that a they viral didn't clip, need to hear uh, a viral clip at one of their playoff games where the student section, like when it got its worst with Nagy, the, the opposing student section started chanting fire Nagy. Yeah. I mean, That's it's just, cool. it's childish, bro. Yeah. Like, uh, but at the end of the day, that's what we sign. You know, we know that going in. That's going to be part of the deal. Was um, w- when you were there, was Mitch Trubisky a leader? Yeah, Mitch was a leader for sure. Um, he was a guy that led not only by example, but he had the right things to say when he did say them. And obviously, being the quarterback, you're kind of the placeholder for leader. So even if you're not a blue chip, blue printed leader um, by nature, you're the guy that people look up to. And we did a lot of tremendous things with him at the quarterback position. We were a dangerous offense. We really were. We had holes in our game. Uh, there were situational things we couldn't take care of, and it ended up biting us in the butt in the uh, in the wild card game. So, so what do you think went wrong? <laughs> well, we 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 didn't run the ball. We didn't run the ball particularly well uh, when we needed to. We had multiple opportunities to to close out the clock there in four minute, and I was part of the unit that didn't get it done. And uh, you know, I've gone on record saying that multiple times. It's stuff I think about a lot. My matchup was tough, but his was as well. You know, and I had guys with me, and we should have got the job done, and we didn't. Um, I remember there was a shot down the middle of the field. I think it was to Anthony Miller on like a play action late that went over his head. Um, That was kind of just a throwaway, smart throwaway, no interception, no sack type play. Um, But in my mind, I remember being like, man, we could have walked out of there right there. Um, Was it kind of the same thing with Cutler that, that it was just the, the skill players around both just weren't enough to get the job done. It was never the quarterback's issue, but we had a lot of big names. We had a lot of big names on the defenses that played. Um, At times we had big names on the bears defense that were way past their expiration date. Yeah. Um, And between those big name free agents that we spent all this money on, we had a bunch of guys who, who were really, Tough players, good college players, but they weren't getting the job done at a competitive level at the NFL. Um, we had a plethora of offensive talent. We could do what we wanted to do offensively for a number of years, and it started with the offensive line. Like we beat the shit out of teams. We we didn't have the high draft picks or um, big time free agents, but you know the seventh rounder, the fifth rounder, the second rounder. I was a first rounder. And I was the only one that was a first rounder. And other than other than me, we all got after it. And there was a lot of guys who did it. Um, and and towards the end of my career, with me being out, there was a lot of guys coming up, six, seven uh, swing guys playing a lot. What is it about football? Like, why did you come back after the Bears? You're you're out for more than a year, it took yep. just over a year, right? And then go back and give it another shot with the Chiefs and then unfortunately get hurt again. What is it about the sport where you made plenty of good money? Why did you want to come back? There's a certain magic 
about this game that you can't replicate anywhere else. Um, you can't 3D print it. You can't put on a can't put on a goggles and sit at your computer and do it. It's not Ready Player One. Um, the feelings you get after a win or a loss, um, the sense of accomplishment at Friday at 1.30 when you finished your final practice of the week, that's going to be strenuous. And now you prepare for battle on Sunday. Now it's like when they tell you to rest up and take care of your body, they mean it and you know, they mean it and their lives depend on it and their families depend on it. And their kids are in school somewhere and they don't want to leave next year to be in Minnesota. Um, and you understand the same is, goes down the line in the locker room. And then the pride aspect of it comes in, the competitive aspect. The same reason I play Call of Duty Warzone every night with my boys and try to get a taste of that, you know. Um, competition, communication, and coordination, really. Uh, practicing all week certain goals and objectives and being able to execute them at a very high level and sometimes at the highest level. It's a special thing. Um, it's a really special thing. So, so that's how you supplement it with with Call of Duty Warzone. That that was going to be my next. I question. use like, that as a placeholder. Uh, you know, you golf, right? But that's golf. Golf is sport. a great way. Uh, golf's a great way to do it. One way that I always uh, bring up team is my wife and I. You know, when sure. we any that at at the root of like a marriage is like we're team. We're team. You know, uh, we're Kobe and Shaq. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we can be dominant. When, when we're communicating and doing all this kind of thing. So football bleeds into everything that I do. Um, I just, there's been so many tremendous men that I've crossed paths with and I've learned from and I've been able to share with because of the game of football. You know what I mean? Like I just, right now, I, I'm just going through a tunnel in my brain of all these awesome dudes that I've met over the years. Hindsight being 2020, do you think you should have played baseball? I always wish that there was multiple universes and uh, multiple realities because I definitely would have loved to have seen how that hand of poker would have played out. Sure. Um, I could throw the fuck out of the ball, man. Way back in the day, I can't even throw a rock at a tree now. I was sitting in my driveway earlier trying, and I was like, man, my shit hurts. Um, so you wouldn't I'm, fill in on the 670, the score, 16 inch softball team this, this season? I could do that. I play catcher, though, all time catcher. Okay. Um, and if they steal. No, no stealing not, allowed. You're okay. That's, but that's we have not, gone to the championship the last two years and we've lost. So okay. I'm looking for some more star power. Well, I, if I had the lights on on the wall behind me, you'd see a couple of Buffalo Grove softball champion, oh, league yeah. championships. Uh, with the one hit wonders. Shout out to the one hit wonders from Buffalo Grove. Nice. Was that your team? Yeah. You played you played softball out here. I what played softball doing? in Chicago while I was on the Bears. God, isn't it the best? And sport? and my name was Ricky. The name on the back of my jersey was Ricky. I mean people knew who you were. Yeah, but I was like, I'm Ricky. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I, you probably have different stories, but why did people not like Jay Cutler here? He's one of my favorite personalities on the planet. What happened? I think people don't. Okay. I'm going to make sure that I say this the right way. Yeah. And um, anything you don't like, we'll just delete. It's recorded. No, no. I'm used to doing a lot. You know what I'm saying? Like Jay is somebody that's hard to connect with. Okay. And I can see how people would take it personally that he's not connecting with them okay. and that it could go awry from a social standpoint. Um, I remember Jay Cutler differently than a lot of people do because I remember the knock on the door at 6 a.m. my rookie year, uh, making sure that I was showing up. You know, drive, he drove to my house, made sure I was awake for whatever. Um, in the summertime, he would, you know, get us to where, wherever we needed to go with the O-line to go train together in Florida with him. You know what I'm saying? When he's going to throw with Brandon Marshall. Um, if, if I, you know, as I was a young single guy that, you know, could barely even uh, keep my house from burning down, he would make sure that I had a place to go for Christmas and a place to go for Thanksgiving. And 
um, at the time, him and Kristen tr treated me like, you know, a younger brother almost. That's what it felt like. And Zach Miller as well was one of those guys. He's the best. That, that was really salt of the earth and tougher than fucking shit. And good and skilled and just good hearted. Cuts his own hair. Sings country music. Is a fabulous. He's a renaissance man. But Have he was a guy. Perform? He was a guy that connected with Jay. And I can see why people wouldn't. But I did. Because I did some shit for Jay that other people just couldn't get done. Sure. You got I was I, I was I, at the time I was irreplaceable to Jay. We talk time, you know, we talk here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. I give you, I give him I give him space. He's like a wild exotic bird. You gotta just let him go. And every I mean, once in a while he'll come to your window and you say hello. His life is something that I mean, he's got the outsider the network, right? Man, he's always drinking beer, he's always drinking whiskey. He's always hunting. Are you wearing outsider right now? Yeah, Love that. Outsider. I just he's got a relationship <clears throat> with a competing afternoon show on the other station, and I, I fucking hate it. Like I, I want him to have a relationship with us, but he made that with them when he was here. Um, but speaking You're of talking about Waddle and Sylvie. Yeah, Waddle and Sylvie. We don't say those names out loud. It's a great show, but we don't say those names out loud. You you want to do this, I think. I'm pretty sure you want to host a daily sports talk radio show, and I'm pretty sure you want to do it in Chicago. You know what? I don't know if you're being serious or not. I've had I half am. this glass of whiskey. My wife and I are obsessed with Chicago. But it's like we love it there, and obviously my time there was unmatched, and the people there are great. One thing I really appreciated about Chicago and the small towns, particularly in the North Shore, outside of Chicago, in the North Shore, I'm going to say that, okay? Yeah. Um, you go to Starbucks in a town like Lake Forest, every single person in there knows that you're on the Bears. 90% of those people know who you are and what your deal is, and, and none of them are going to bother you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they're not going to talk to you. They're going to be nice. They're not going to be weird about it. You, they, they want you to feel at home when you're a Chicago athlete. And I think that that's what a lot of athletes in other cities and other towns miss out on is that honest to goodness Midwest charm that comes along with the huge city. And uh, the, the sexy nature of Chicago is also that homey, cozy vibe. All right, so you've got three options then. There, there are three shows for you to join because we're not going to put you on ESPN 1000. You can join – be the third chair on Molly and Haw. You can join Dan Bernstein and Lawrence Holmes and occasionally Layla Rahimi on Wednesdays, or you can join us, Danny Parkins and Matt Spiegel. What show are you jumping on? I think I would uh I think I would guest with you guys and I would just bring the green light podcast to Chicago. I don't I don't want you to guest with us. I would I come hang out, drink beer, see if I was people. working, if I was working with you, I wouldn't be able to come and you know smoke a joint in studio or have some whiskey. Sure what I would like to do. Is, is just have a glass of whiskey when I come in while I'm recording for Greenlight. We can just cross over content. All right. Yeah, that's fine. We could, we could build another studio. And I'll get you a, I'll get you a hoodie. Yeah. Oh, oh thank you so much for the Greenlight hoodie. The, yeah. the last Greenlight I watched was you and Chris uh, crossover with Danny Amendola's podcast. I think it's called Game Night. Yeah. Right? I sat there and watched the whole thing. How fun was that? Danny Amendola is, uh, is, a, is a great guy. Yeah. Um, God, he was a good player. He could do everything. He was like a true slash guy. Real uh, bring your lunch to work guy. Hard bring your lunch to work money. guy. Spaniard, bring your Spanish lunch to work. <laughs> you made your own butter this week. Made my own that? butter. Um, you churn your own butter at home? Made my own butter. So uh, we got Amazon Whole Foods delivered us a jug of heavy whipping cream. Sure. Um, God, I could drink that. I do drink it straight out of the jug. Dude, straight out of the jug. Putting, put one Oreo in your mouth and then uh, a dip of like either half and half or yep. heavy whipping cream. Yep. Yikes. What is thicker? Or what's, what's, cream. no, I know the heavy whipping cream is thicker, but like what exactly is half and half? It's half milk, half cream, half whipping cream? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's almost three quarter milk. Uh, yeah, it's, After... it's, it's not thick enough for me. Like, if I'm trying to indulge in one Oreo before I go to bed or something like that, it's always got to be heavy, heavy whipping cream. 
Yeah, man. Oh. But you made your own butter. So I made my own butter. Uh, I took the heavy whipping cream. I put it in the KitchenAid, whisked the shit out of it, and I just kind of left it. Uh, thought I was doing it wrong for like 10 minutes, and then I came back after three more minutes, and it yeah. was like water and butter. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed it, and I went to pick it up, and it just squished more water. Yep. And I put it in my ice cold water, and I squished out all the, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. then the cool part came where I thought I was being awesome because I was watching TikTok videos to see how to do it. Sure. I put my wax paper down, and I started like, I was like, yep. And I caught my wife's attention from across the kitchen, and I was like trying to do that. And the butter ended up getting fucked up, the shape. But, but it was still, beautiful. It was made a, I made a ball, like a beautiful ball, yep. and I put it in a bowl, and I like smoothed out the top. After I mixed, I, we mixed a bunch of sea salt in there. Like sure. really good, really good salt, I guess. I don't Malden. know where it was from. Did you use Malden? What kind of salt was it? French salt. French salt. Probably Malden. Yeah. Malden? No. 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 Okay. Yeah. Never mind. But put the, so I, I blended the, you know, I blended the salt and then I balled it, put it in the, the, the bowl and then I sprinkled. Sure. Uh, she made uh, some Kamut uh, flour. Yeah. Uh, biscuits, biscuits. Delicious. Yeah. Oh. What is the, uh, what's the worst thing that's ever happened to you in a pile? You're, you're trying to recover a fumble. Worst thing that's ever happened to me in a pile. Well, and I want to think that you've done to someone. No, I want to make sure I get this, this, this right. Uh, and you might have to fact check this. Sure. Uh, oh, wait, Kyle Long, uh, fine. Oh, you got fined for it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -oh. um, I've got a computer right here in front of me. So it was a fine. It might have been against the Patriots. Come you got on. you got fined seven thousand eight hundred and seventy five dollars for a scuffle in the Rams game. Is that it? Yeah, that was that was a long time ago. It was like the most recent fine I had. It was against somebody. It might have been the Giant. It was the game that Kevin White caught a big pass and it got taken back. Well, the one money. time that Kevin White ever caught a big pass. Yes, he caught a big pass and I had a penalty and they took it back. And, and Barstool Big Cat that. makes a big deal out of it all the time. So bottom line is that game, uh, I was pulling, I was reaching my hand out, bending over a pile and a player that was laying on his back next to my teammate kicks me with the heel of his cleat square in the in the nuts Ooh. like and you know these size 12 cleats they cover a lot of ground and it doesn't take a big cleat to yeah. cover much ground on sure. this amigo and he got me so good and i was pissed and that's the guy who i ended up getting later on on the kevin white play it was like the next time i had the opportunity to see him he he blitzed i grabbed him i literally picked him up when he blitzed and i just body slammed him and I sure. just ragged all of them. And Matt, I think it was Nags. Nags was pissed. Yeah, but that's Nags not illegal. Pissed. It was, it was, it was almost like, uh, unnecessary aggressive. See, that's, 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 that's bullshit though. Football has gotten to be way too soft. There's too many cameras, Shane. Okay. Too many angles. You used to be able to get away with things. Um, if somebody got you cheap, you used to be able to get them back. There used to be opportunities and uh, gaps in the security. But now, man, now everything is okay. on tape. So the, the the Bears have a very unique opportunity <laughs> right, with the number one pick. They're definitely yeah. going to trade it away. If they don't do it, it's wrong. And and on the show, we're talking about trading the one for the two, trading the two to the four, trading the four down to the nine, and then drafting a local kid like Peter Skaronsky, right, who the majority of the league doesn't believe can be a tackle because his arms are too short. They're, they're reportedly coming in at just over – 32 inches do you believe that that is as big of a disadvantage as folks believe it is Wani thinks it does Wani I'm, said not, I'm not gonna say that as it pertains to Skaronsky and I'm pronouncing that correctly yeah you are yeah from as, as it as it pertains to to Skaronsky um I think his game is is good um but you'll never know until you get to the to the league when the measurables get exponentially larger. These guys are longer, faster, stronger. I do believe that arm length is pertinent 
for the tackle position. I do think that a guy – like I had 33 and a third arms. What are his? You know, that's I'm low average. I mean, NFL and average. I, I, I was below – so that's my point. Right. I was below average. When I played tackle, when I played guard, it was like peeling fucking bananas. When I was healthy, I was it was like peeling bananas, yeah. getting hands on guys. When you're at tackle, it's like when a guy like you and me goes to step on an NBA court and you're just like, whoa, these guys are like longer than I thought. And right. they can touch me from further away. They can block my shot from over there. Oh, my God. You need that length, that tackle, to be able to touch guys before they touch you. So can you draft a guy like that to play guard at nine? Um, I mean, that's what, not, where were you that's taking, not, like 14? I was at 20. 20. And, and um, that was a reach. Yeah, I so, mean, yeah, Hub Arkish said so. Hub, I hope Hub's Hub's doing well. He's I know he went. So well. I, I know he went through some stuff with his health, and I He's just doing so well. Uh, Hub and I have had some funny conversations that stemmed from his initial take. Yeah, throwing the pencil right, right yeah. on these airwaves. Yeah, he did on the on six seventy. Yeah, it was our draft show. Got it. Yeah, Hub uh, man. So can they take him at nine to be a guard? Because if he, uh, nine might even be an overreach for him. Yeah, not you, you can't take him at nine. You can't take it. You can't take. You can't take a, a a a guy with a question mark on a measurable that high. Did you interact with Ryan Poles when you were in Kansas City? I did. I did. And you know what? I have no, nobody's ever asked me that. Um, and when I came to the Chiefs, I was healthy. I was I was feeling great. I was the starting right guard at the end of minicamp. You know, at the end of uh, – not minicamp, at the end of OTAs and everything, I, w- I was at the right guard position. Now, Trey Smith was coming along way faster than I wanted him to, um, and he's a, he's an absolute monster. He's he's a world beater at right guard. Um, but Ryan Poles, back to Ryan Poles. Yeah. Chris Jones rolls up on me. I broke my leg. I had to get surgery. The rehab process was, you know – all summer long in the building every single day. And there was this guy that was in the weight room every single day. There was a big dude and I kind of recognized him. Turned out I did my research. His name was Ryan Poles and he's in scouting or something like that. He's upstairs, as we say, um, you know, he's somewhere upstairs doing something for the chiefs and he played O line with Olin Cruz. So I walked up and introduced myself one day and we, you know, we rapped for a minute about Olin and bears O line and he's a great guy. He couldn't have been nicer and and more bright and uh, pr- like he was regimented. He did the same thing every day. I would see him in there same time because you know when you're in a training room, they have windows for when you're supposed to be in there. He was in there the same time we were. Like he's on an NFL schedule. This is a guy that lives it. So for Bears fans, you have to understand uh, the smartest guys in the room, other than the quarterbacks, I think are the offensive line and. Um, people would tend to agree with me. Ryan Poles is the smartest one in his room. So uh, you think about a leader in, in, in that situation. Also, coming from uh, Kansas City, seeing the things that he's seen, albeit he can't clone Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid, right? But he can understand what works. Um, and he can understand that sometimes guys that are question marks from a character standpoint can do well if you surround them with good men. And they have a, a, a litany of good men in Kansas City, and I hope that he can replicate that in Chicago to try to build around a guy like Justin Fields if you want to keep Justin Fields. Are you talking about someone like Tyreek Hill, like that has questionable character stuff and they were still able to use him and, and keep the distractions away from the football field? Well, I, I you know, and I hate to do this. I I hate to do this because he's a friend. He's a friend of mine. I consider him a friend of mine. But Frank Clark, a guy who's had run ins with the law. Sure. Um, somebody where a lot of people say, well, that's just another, you know, another bad example of an NFL. Frank Clark's a really good guy. And, you know, when he shows up to play, he shows up to play for his teammates. And that's why he's one of the all time playoff sack leaders. And uh, Andy Reid loves misfit toys. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, he saw him as a misfit toy, didn't he? He was like, well, you know, he's halfway between a football player and a baseball player. He's yeah. he, he's uh you know, he's got a strange, you know, everything just looks kind of strange with Mahomes, the way he runs, the way he throws. But Andy Reid said, this is the best football player I've ever seen in my life. Matt Nagy was in love with him. And then Nagy had to obviously jump ship 
um, go, to go elsewhere. But uh, Ryan Poles has seen it all. He knows what works. And I just – I trust him. I really do. I really do. Did you see the interview that uh, Pat Mahomes' dad did with our show where he said that the Bears told Patrick that they were drafting him and then didn't? I did see that. You did see that. Do you believe yeah. that? I do believe that. You do believe that. Because the NFL works that way. Um, it's a goddamn you know, shame. Well, they, you know, there's so much smoke and mirrors. Um, and maybe at the time they did think they wanted to draft him. And then when it came time to press the red button, um, somebody panicked. Somebody Fucking said something Ryan else. Pace. Don't say somebody. Well, we don't know that. Fucking I mean, uh, we don't know if it was Ryan Pace, yeah, though, because yeah. we weren't. We well, weren't. Talked, what quarterback he was taking? He we weren't. We weren't in those rooms. You know what I mean? Okay. All right. I, 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 I'm, the, I'm, player, the first, I'm the I'm the first one. I'm the first one to say, hey, Ryan Pace. It's pretty obvious that there are some guys out there that, that could be taken in front of in front of Mitch. And I think it did Mitch a tremendous disservice if he had started his, his career as maybe a second, a third round guy. We could be a starter with a different we could be looking at a starter doing really well. If you take a look at the numbers that Mr. Bisky put out there, he's done well. He's produced in the in the league. Um we could be looking at a different narrative. But I, I've roasted him for that before and I'm not going to beat a dead horse. What do what what do the Bears need? Do they need a do you want to see them trade away the number one for someone like T. Higgins? Or do you want to see them trade a third rounder for someone like Mike Evans on a one year deal? If you have if you have your eyes on a, an edge rusher, a true winner at the pass rush position that falls outside of your first pick, then go ahead and get Okay, so Justin Fields likes his receiver, uh, Smith, Jackson Smith. J Jackson Smith in, in Jigba. He likes in Jigba, right? Yeah. Um, if you can go get a receiver in the draft, go do that. If you can trade it away and then go acquire a receiver, like a guy like T. Higgins, like you said, I like T. Higgins a lot. I think he's a, okay. he's a threat. Um, and then go pair that with a rusher. Then you're complementing both sides of the ball. You need to bolster the offensive line. You can do that rounds three through seven. Um, both sides of the ball. You need a run stopper, and you need a couple guys that can double team. Two more for you. This offensive line, out of the pieces they have there, between God bless, Larry Borum, yep, Tevin Jenkins, seventy five. Who, who who can stay there? Like uh, and the other kid, uh, the uh, the the seventh rounder that they've been playing or whatever. Who I like their I like their tackle. Um, I like their tackle. I like Jenkins. I like uh, I really like the attitude and the preparation and the things you can't put a number on that Sam Mustafer brings to a group. Braxton um, Jones. You talking about Braxton Jones? Yeah, I'm talking about Braxton Jones played really well. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's great. He, he's going to be even better this year. Um, I think Jenkins there's you know I love his game, but there's a question mark with the health position. And yeah, the back is tough. Backs are tough, man. Backs are tough. Uh, but if you can run, you can play. So as long as his his lower half uh, holds up, he should be good. And I think he brings that demeanor to the offensive line that they really need. They need a guy that's going to be tipping people over piles and protecting the quarterback because they've got a guy like a Josh Allen who's going to be running all over the field part of altercations all game long every week it's such a fucking long season i just that's my biggest concern like just okay do you think that the bears should should deal justin fields no no why no because you still have two years left on a rookie deal after this season you've got the biggest cap space in the nfl you have someone who's incredibly talented and i know that a running quarterback has technically never won a super bowl but I'm not even concerned. My shame, my concern, and I, I agree with you. Like he is, he's a phenom. The things that he can do physically, it's like when Mahomes runs around and then throws it like you know uh, underhand twenty yards where yeah. he's not looking. It just makes your jaw drop. When Justin Fields play plays, you cannot look away from it. But I think about Lamar Jackson. I think about Justin Fields. I think about. 
the anomalies that are Patrick Mahomes and and Josh Allen for staying relatively healthy the entire season, and even those guys were beat up at the end. How can you stay healthy for that long if you're Justin Fields? If you're not just if if you can't really become a guy who's going to rely on your arm and have a th- a threat running the football. Well, I mean, as you know, he wasn't a running quarterback at Ohio State. Like he, he no, he, he he could throw it. He could throw it all over the yard. But but he's but, required in this offense without <clears throat> a very solid offensive line to flee. He the doesn't pocket. have he doesn't have a dominant receiver. Right. I I like his I like his uh, his targets. I, I do like him. I love Cole Komet. Yeah. Um, I think that Mooney is a guy that can make people miss after the catch and can get open, uh, open enough for Justin to feel comfortable throwing him the football. Um, they need to have that running game dialed in. It starts it starts with the, with running the football, and then they need to have a guy that they can throw to when nobody is open that will find a zone that's not being covered, or if they are covered, they will make a catch. I always talk about Travis Kelsey, and I always talk about the ability for Patrick to see a blanket around everybody else on the field and that sense of desperation where it's like you can't breathe, you're looking for the surface. Travis is there with his hand out, like throw me the football. He needs a Justin Fields needs a guy like that so that he can stay healthy for the entirety of the season. You want to see it. I want to see it. The people of Chicago deserve it. I can't imagine a better guy to bring – uh, to bring Bears fans together uh, for a Super Bowl run down the road. And Ryan Poles, I trust him. Um, they've got some pieces, but they need more firepower. They need more firepower, man. All right, so let's say they get a deep threat and a wide, wide out that you're talking about like that. Or maybe let's say that guy that you're talking about is Saquon Barkley, who can run the ball but also be a threat in the pass game. Then they need a left tackle. They need a right tackle. Don't they get need- Saquon Barkley, and here's my reason, Shane. You said don't get Saquon Barkley? Don't get Saquon Barkley, and here's my reason. Okay. You can create a running game with a dominant offensive line. If you have a dominant running back and an average offensive line, if one of those pieces being your running back goes down, your running game is to shit. If you have a dominant foundation to your offensive line, a la the Philadelphia Eagles, they will carry you through – Anything that happens, you take a look at the Dallas Cowboys. Cooper Rush comes in for the Dallas Cowboys. They're still able to run the ball. Um, Tony Pollard, Zeke Elliott, different styles of running, but that offensive line can a group that that group can adjust to whatever it is you put in front of them. The Eagles don't care who's in front of them; they're going to block them, and they did so with the Chiefs. They did it in the Super Bowl. That's the kind of group that you need to go win a Super Bowl. Go get, go get your, you know, uh, your your Jimbo coverts. Go get your, you know, go get your beasts. Go get your legends you, you to play up front. Kelsey. Justin you, Fields needs a Jason Kelsey. You need multiple guys to create a cohesive unit that will lead the team. The offensive line in number is the largest group on the football fan on the football team. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, uh, they're the leaders. They're the leaders in the weight room. They're the leaders when it comes to walkthroughs. They're the, they're the leaders, yada, yada, yada. They're going to get your beers after they win the Super Bowl. People okay. lead, they follow the offensive line. You get a guy like Saquon Barkley, you're putting the hands of your team in a superstar, and you put a, you, the hands of your, uh, your team in a running back, um, and, and things can happen. Even when you've got 100 plus million in cap space, and Saquon's probably only going to cost about 11 to 12 per. No, I still, I still firmly believe in that. Okay, all right. So, when's the next time they're in the playoffs? Let's assume real quick that they pick up a couple tackles, they get a number one proven wideout, regardless of if it, we call it next year twenty three. N- next year would be twenty three would be the first possible year. Yeah, can they be a playoff team in twenty twenty three twenty four? I think it'll be twenty four or twenty five. I mean, we're looking at. Okay. Next year will be a wow. Look, look what we did with one off season, and then yeah, um, it'll be let's continue to build off of there. What's uh, what's next for you? Because I, I know you can't just sit at home and, and golf and take care of a baby all day. We're gonna go to Italy, um, and we're gonna spend some time over there, go all over and eat everything. And we've kind of got an open schedule there, but we've got our uh, our residences, so to speak, booked. And we're looking forward to it. It's our first big trip with a with a young child, and 
we're stoked, man. Get some culture in our lives. Sure. Get out of Dodge. I'm just waiting to uh yeah, I'm pissed. I listened to the Joe Rogan experience and yeah. I've been I've been waiting, I've been waiting for him to do a, a podcast that's based solely on the UFOs in the last few weeks. And I'm really disappointed the, uh, that like there the hasn't Chinese been one. Spy balloons? Spy balloons, but also, you know, the things that l lack any uh, visible propulsion source yeah. or heat signatures. These are all things that are fascinating to me, things that go bump in the night. You know Do what I'm you saying? think that the U.S. government is putting those things there to distract us from the train derailments in East Palestine, Ohio? They could be. Yeah. Absolutely. I and I really, I really think about the people in Ohio right now it sucks. Um, that are... You know, I think about people, people all over, you know, fuck people in Flint, Michigan are still figuring out water. Um, Ohio. Yeah. You can't even go outside right now. There's people with rashes and uh, lesions. It's, it's nightmare. It's a nightmare. What do you, um, so what else, dude? I've got, I've got one more thing for you. Uh, my, my co-producer, Chris Tannehill wanted me to make sure I ask you this. When you are, you're like seven or eight years old when your dad co-starred in an action movie aside robert de niro what did that do you have any like recollection have you seen the movie since what did it feel like to have your dad as someone who was a a, a, a star in the nfl and then also starring in a movie opposite robert de niro wait hold on a second robert de niro was it de niro what did he do D did i get that wrong i have no idea he's been in more stuff than i can imagine i, I think it's called uh Oh, maybe Something I got that, that wrong. Oh no, 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 John Travolta. I'm sorry, John Travolta. Okay, okay. Start it from the top. We'll do that again. All right. So, yeah. Let, let me recut that. So you're seven or eight years old. Chris yeah. Anhill, my co-producer, wanted to make sure I ask you this question. Your father, all-star, Pro Bowler, all that shit in the NFL, is also starring in a movie alongside John Travolta. What does that feel for a child? In Kyle and Chris Blanc. Well, it's funny because uh, in our family home here in Virginia, there's a picture of my dad and Travolta. Like they're two handsome faces next to each other, and they, like they got each other in a headlock. Like they look like real frat bro boy yeah. buddies, which kind of concerns me a little bit, um, knowing how my guy Johnny is. You know, yeah, he's a weird. Uh, he's he, you know, <laughs> fast, fast mover, old Johnny T. He likes to move fast. He gets a little handsy. Uh, allegedly, but he, oh, him, right. him, and my dad had a great time um, uh, on Broken Arrow. Was the name Broken of the Arrow, movie. That was it. And there was some, you know, Broken Arrow is code apparently for stolen or lost nuclear weapons. Okay. And there were some nuclear warheads that were being transferred, and uh, they got, you know, derailed, detached. And my dad, who was in the military in the movie, ended up being a bad guy who was working for Travolta. So he's like, double agent, stole the nukes, gave them to Travolta. It was cool. I remember going out to like Lake Powell area and uh, hanging out around a bunch of Humvees and seeing a bunch of weapons that were like blanks. And we would hide behind rocks when they would shoot for the for their uh, actually shoot film, yeah. you know, not shoot guns. There's my dog bear. And – uh, so pretty he's an awesome dog and uh i just remember as a kid it was cool being out there and i was like my dad was jacked and he looked like duke nukem he looked exactly <laughs> exactly flat like top and everything yeah 100 percent like duke nukem so my little brother howie and i would play duke nukem 64 and he was like it's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum <laughs> remember it was like yeah. he had he had 101 liners um that was what it was like playing, you know, my dad was the guy in the video game, essentially. Like he was he was too cool for school, man. We were we were head over heels. So I'll get you out on this. Professionally, what's next? Do you just want to rot or do you want to just like keep doing the podcast with Chris Greenlight, which is awesome? I know you do some stuff with NASCAR. You just want to rot or what do you want to do? Yeah, well, I've uh I, I've got a really cool role that i've carved out at cbs uh cbs sports for the pregame uh, on nfl sundays I, I get an opportunity to kind of warm up the the big show with sure. uh phil sims and bill cower james brown and 
Nate Burleson. They're all great guys to work with. And I get to put a suit on on Sunday and pretend like I'm a professional. Sure. Uh, you know, the key is just not saying uh, too much, but saying enough to where people don't pay attention. You know what I'm saying? It's like uh, if, 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 there's got to be a placeholder. You know, you need to talk for 20 seconds on TV, right? Yeah. You don't want to be the 20 seconds that ends up on Twitter. So you just say 20 seconds of just like gobbledygook. And no. people go, people go, well, I didn't really understand that. But what does the next guy have to say? No, and no, then. No, don't do that. You want to be the one they, they remember. You want to be the viral clip. Yeah, well, I work with a few guys that are tremendous at that. So I let them do that. And sometimes I'm lucky enough to be sitting next to them looking handsome, not saying a word, which sure. is the best way to be in a viral clip. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So I love that. I love working in studio. Um, I love being a dad. Uh, we really enjoy playing games. We've talked about taking a camping trip in the next couple of weeks when it warms up. Sure. Um, just trying to introduce our little one to the world, man. Well, I appreciate you doing this, taking the time out on a Friday. I should be at a bar getting drunk, trying to find a woman, but I'm not. You um, will be soon, I'm sure. Yeah, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, we'll see. This was a lot of fun, man. I'm glad we did this. Yeah, thank you very much for doing it. Keep up the good work, and we'll watch on CBS, the the pre-pregame show. Um, and we'll, we'll keep listening to Greenlight Podcast. Thank you for doing it. All right, dude. All right, talk to you later. Hope you enjoyed it. Likewise.